Hello, everybody. It's, it's pretty nice to be here. We were talking with Olivia. Neither one of us are very content in getting in front of an audience, I don't think. But uh, for the sake of this talk, I, I do everything last minute, Ginny, you can tell. And I get together with my son and we threw it together. So some things I'm going to go rather quickly through because I have a couple of films towards the end that are a little bit longer. So uh, when I come someplace, I always look back, as we do, you look back at the past. So what you're going to see here is my beginnings. I've been a photographer for, kind of a working photographer for about 30, 35 years now. So my uh, be career began as a social worker in the United States when I finished college. And I went down to the southern part of the United States where I uh, started a news newspaper with friends. Uh, it was a very divided... You hear about our country today, well our country's always been divided. And uh, this time, the issue's more overt, the issues of racism and violence, but today it seems to be coming back. It's a very disappointing part of our history. Um, but these are the people, the sharecroppers, the field workers that were living at that time in abject poverty and hunger in Arkansas, in the Arkansas Delta. And it was my beginning of photography simply because it was my introduction to how to work with people. And I had studied art photography a little bit in Boston and I was studying journalism, but I never thought I was going to be a working photographer. This would be my life until we started this little newspaper and then I started taking these pictures. When I was done in the South, our, new, we, our business really got put out of business. We, uh, the Ku Klux Klan was active. The organization you hear about now, thanks to Donald Trump, but they were very active, and uh, we had a, a lot of trouble, a lot of violence. And I came home to uh, my hometown in Boston, which is also a divided place, interestingly, being racially. So we, we all kinds of people together, but we had a lot of problems in Boston. It was a very sophisticated city. My neighborhood was a kind of uh, a lower income neighborhood where I was born and raised up and I came back to look at my neighborhood again, the way that a lot of us return home. Um, and these are the people that I found then at that time. It was uh, my neighborhood when I was there was Irish and some Jewish and Italian. And I came back and it was black and Puerto Rican who had made that kind of transmission. And I had a fabulous time for her, I think. During those couple of years, um, I couldn't get any work at all. so I brought the camera out, kind of my discretion, we sort of survived. Um, these are the people I, I lived around, you know, you go into people's houses and take pictures of the kids. Um, uh, and this was a, a great life for a while. Um, the ugliness that we see today was always there. This is in South Boston, was my neighboring community. Um, they had a school busing crisis where they brought the kids in, they were busing, and, uh, and I had come out of the South where I saw the racism in a certain, it was very much there. I wasn't expecting in sophisticated American city that they would be throwing Coke bottles at children getting on buses, but they were. And this is what I found. Um, about this time, like I said, I'm going through my history very quickly. Things started to look up in my life. I was living with Dorothy and things were going well, and then Dorothy got breast cancer. And I did a, a project with her. When I call it a project, it's not the case. It sounds so strange. She simply asked me to photograph her illness because she wanted to talk to other women about the subject. And it was way before the time when, it was, when women were doing this, quite literally. Uh, they were discouraged, as a matter of fact. If you knew about medicine back then, women would, you know, even in my case, when I went to the hospital, they would talk to me about Dorothea's illness, not to Dorothea. So it's, it's an astonishing time. But these are a few photographs from her. Uh, I guess she almost called these uh, her portraits of herself in some way. This is after the biopsy. And this is after her final chemotherapy. I thought she looked great bald. I photographed a lot of bald pictures of her because they took her hair off. And they, I think they would look particularly beautiful at that time. And I lost her a couple of years later. So that's the way life is. You have the great things and you go up and down. And the first assignment I had about that time when she was going through the illness was terrible. It was, it was in an emergency room. I got a job in the hospital, which was the last place I wanted to go, as you can imagine. Um, but I found out I was also beginning to moderately cover conflict. And I've talked to some of my friends here, conflict situations. And here, they were saving lives. So I came to love this place, and I did a book on it called The Knife and Gun Club, simply because these were saving people saving lives. It wasn't always very nice. This woman they were killing with here died of a, of a gunshot wound. But they were all they were doing good things, and you get really tired of people doing 
bad things, don't you? And, uh, yeah. This is here on the table. People say well, that's an ugly, appalling photograph, and uh, it is because I meant it to be. Uh, suddenly, there was this person we were all wanting to be alive, and suddenly she wasn't. There was nothing left. We always talked about it. she was, you know, nothing more than something that was left on the floor. You know? Now, Janine enters the situation here. I've got a, a great um, love of my life, and Janine, and we met, and uh, this is our first project together, which is called The Below Lines About Poverty in America, at that time, which was in the, uh, 1986. Uh, and when I say she's part of this, she did a lot of the research, met people, and we would go down the road. And uh, again, it was the same process. Uh, I think when we was talking, we would do a lot of interviews. A lot of it's textual. It's not photographs. The photographs happen to be appendages in a way to the text material. Uh, but these are people that I met as we were traveling. This is up in the mountains of Tennessee. Um, and as you know, in a lot of places of the world, there's a great combination of great poverty and incredible beauty, that, uh, moments of beauty. And these are just kids being children. This is a housing project in Chicago. Um, and the sink just fell out of the wall that day, literally. So I don't want to, I can't read the time for anecdotes because we got to move on, but this is a, a, a man who just got out of prison. And this is a girl who wrote him in, a woman who wrote him in prison. So they had a reunion. This is in a shanty town, a homeless kind of shelter in New York. In about 89, uh, the drug crisis was overwhelming. As it's coming back now in many places, perhaps here too, heroin. Uh, but at that time it was crack. Uh, we live in a neighborhood that was overwhelmed with it. So I moved into the, looking at the problems of drug addiction and, and, uh, and its cost to communities in America. This woman was a nurse before she became an addict. This is Sam. This is ruthless. He's a corner guard, a soldier, a kind of drug soldier, heavily armed. Um, kind of keep peace in his block of the neighborhood. This is in Philadelphia. And what came out of the drug wars, if you, I'm sure you all know, is uh, worse problems with the race, more problems with discrimination. Uh, this man was, uh, they were, these, this is a pretense. This is a, the people out there looking for a gun that he never had because I happened upon the scene when they pulled him out of his car. Um, This is Tom, who's a subway beggar in, in New York. So you're going to go through a lot of subjects. What most of these are is I don't get long-term assignments as a photographer. Where I get, we always laugh, I get one-day assignments. Um, and, uh, and you do your best you can, you go out, you do, you, you do your best you can, you hope that, you know, you satisfy the editors. But satisfying yourself, anybody who works for publications and satisfying the editors are usually two different things. Um, but you try to, when you're out there, try to see something your own way. And then, something, then you find something very beautiful like this. This is my own way, simply because the situation was so astonishing. This is in uh, an area of Brooklyn. These the people were just having a great time on a hot day, and, uh, and it was just a lot of fun. And a lot of fun was a prop. I did a, uh, I went to Life Magazine. It was my last really thing that I did for them on a, um, thinking I would try to find something very innocent, so I weaseled my way into the magazine world by something called American Family. It turned out to be the most controversial thing I ever did because they didn't want to do a thing on gay families. They didn't, you know, they misunderstood the cultures of the people that I was meeting. It was a disaster. But this, they understood this was the, uh, uh, the first story we did was on a birth of a, of a baby. In a, one of the stories that in the, in the, in the middle 90s was on uh, drug gangs, which were part of American Life Star. Uh, it was the drug gang in Kansas City. Uh, this is a sexual assault that didn't happen. People just got out of line. Everybody was drinking too much drugs. It could have been awful. That's one of the times I think I was there with a the camera that slowed things down. Um, I was there because I had a great relationship. And it comes, a lot of photography comes out of relationships. I had a great relationship with a young woman there who was a kind of, uh, uh, how can you say it? When you're, when you're on the road as a journalist, you meet these people you can't believe. On one hand, they, they're they pretty messed up. On the other hand, they're very protective of you and they take care of you, and she took care of me. AIDS, 
flew into Africa. This is the first case of AIDS that I saw in the community. A young woman, 15 years old, and her baby. I was with a nurse, so uh, it was pretty clear what was going to happen to that community in, in Niger. So we're cutting up to the time until about 9-11. Um, I always call this literally Janine's project. Uh, when 9-11 happened, we all have stories, we all know the situation. And I was in Budapest at the time, and I came home to this and didn't want to go down there. And I had the same premonition that I think we talked about, a lot of you had, that this was not a terrible tragedy, and 3,000 people were killed, but it was just the very beginning to what was going to happen. And of course, it's come to pass, right? This little snow globe that was for sale in a jewelry store of the, the World Trade Towers. Firemen in the rubble. They didn't find any survivors, as you probably know. Uh, the thing about these pictures now is we look at pictures of Syria, we look at everything. This, you know, people in America forget that they say these are terrible, but they're, they're every day in many countries today. There was no body in that coffin. They never found the body at that time, anyway. And I had a week we did a study on uh, a mental hospital in, in <coughs> Mexico. Um, quickly put, this is the worst kind of photography for me. We had no permissions. People had no right to say no. I just walked into this place because that was my job and, and tried to report on the absolute awful, awful conditions in these hospitals. But the photos were used. Yeah, they were used by human rights groups and later, and they closed that place down in, in, in Mexico. This is in Paraguay. Um, kind of a, sometimes you have to kind of balance what you're doing. Um, at the same time that I was working on a project called War is Personal, uh, which is a, one that took on myself after a couple of assignments. I was like everybody else. How do you comment on today's violences? And I did a set of a book on, when I say, and I, she did the research again on 15 individuals in America who had been, the consequences of the war had weighed heavily on them. We took a break and we did a project on uh, old houses, abandoned houses, or I did in the Middle West with my therapy. I would go out all by myself uh, into uh, Nebraska, just the places that have been left behind by farmers who go broke. And, um, and this is, I'm showing this because it's the lead to the film that we'll show you tonight, which is, a, a, again, a, a part of the story. Um, that's that same house you, you came inside, and, and, and there was the you know, family doll, the dolls everywhere. Um, people were up and left because they went broke, or someone in the family died, or they couldn't afford the, the taxes. A horse just trying to follow me into the house. And this is in the town of Corinth, which you'll see Corinth later. This is the, uh, 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 the snowy bed. We actually met the woman who was conceived on this bed. Uh, we, we went around the town saying, you know, there's a strange thing. I found this beautiful bed. And she thought my parents' bed. And you go, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful house? You'd like to bring it home with you if you could stick it in the car. This is the work I'm doing, a project now, whenever I can, I don't get around to just making portraits of the people that I meet, just for, um, this is the photographer Robert Frank, uh, who's a hero to a lot of us, and deservedly so, you get to know him, he's no disappointment, he's cranky but lovely. <laughs> This is a, a <coughs> Marine suffering incredibly terrible stress disorder. From He was the lone survivor, actually, of an explosion in a Humvee. And uh, that he was smoking an electronic cigarette and disappearing in the smoke, so to speak. This is another veteran. We'll see him later. This is Thomas Young, who became quite a well-known subject of a film in the United States. Um, Thomas was fourth day in Iraq, he was shot in the spine, and he spent years and years and years in just agony. But he was very much against the war. Towards the end of his life, he painted his walls black, and he went in, and his, mainly his partner was Batman, because he felt that Batman was a, a person who came out of tragedy and tried to do something good with his life. So these are random photographs from around the country. Uh, 
Last year when I was here, actually, I think I might have shown the film, Melvin Cook was his name, and Melvin was a Ku Klux Klansman, and Melvin died, and this is, I was invited to the funeral, and I came out there, and uh, this picture would never happen, I couldn't find it. We're at the right house, so I stopped by the funeral home, and they, built, they buried Melvin in his Coca-Cola shirt. Uh, Melvin was a, a pretty, pretty bad man, in terms of the racial <coughs> crimes and the things that he did in his life. But he was trying, he's, in his own way, he's trying to change. He really so I'm not going to see what we have here. The, um, let me kind of quickly, the thing that the last couple of years that I, that I worked on, discussed with a friend here, was um, when the worst personal book came out, uh, the trouble with projects is they, they, they come out and they go, and then you kind of say, what is next? Because suddenly the, the theme that's, you were working on, and I was talking to friends here, we were talking about, you work on the, the subject of constant warfare that's now eating up our world to the point where any of the problems that we have can't be addressed until you, you know, bring the world under control. And I did the book War is Personal, when it was done, I realized it was basically a book of language, more than photographs, so the photographs people remember. Um, so I wrote a play, and, and, and it's called uh, In a Faraway Mind. And where the words came from, I don't know if the title's up here, that is because I came to see, I showed you Thomas Young. Well, the time that I visited Thomas, I had done a story about him. I actually published it in the book, as War is Personal, and I thought it was true, and I wrote the story. And I came to see him, and I started saying, the last time I saw you, you were having an overdose on your medicines, and I felt bad if you actually brought him to the hospital. And he said, I lied to you. I didn't tell you the truth. He said, in fact, I tried to kill myself. And, um, and he was apologetic for the lies. But so I actually published a story that wasn't true. But what he said to me, that he, what had happened is he was, his wife, who was a waitress, had not come home that night. And she was staying with a friend. He suspected it was a boyfriend or an ex-boyfriend. And he was so afraid of being alone, he saw himself someday being totally alone that he said, I can't be alone, he tried to kill himself. But the term he uses, is, I'm, so I'm in a faraway mind, and that's the title. What, the, what you have here is, is not a textual piece, it's a, a visual piece. When I did the play, and I've only shown it a couple of times, we started, we started with a visual piece of the real people. We started originally not ever thinking that I would put that into the final production, but the actors all keep saying, you've got to leave it there, because we like the idea of playing real people. So what you're seeing here doesn't have any text to it. The music is something that his son really wrote one, one day. So these are photographs <coughs> to, to a piece of, a very minimal piece of music from the war's personal work. So you'll know this is Carlos who lost his marine son in, in Iraq. Um, and this is Thomas Young. This year, actually, he died of, uh, of related. Um, this is Mike Carmen, who was a combat veteran and a uh, combat medic in Iraq and suffered terrible stress disorder.
This is Princess Samuels, 22 years old at this time. Um, what's that? Down there. <laughs> Thank you. Mm-hmm. You know that one, yeah. Okay. <coughs> I know we missed those. No, that's, uh, that's right. Um, well, what's happened to me is a uh, target that happens to everybody that you get a little older and you start seeing the, the things. That, as we know, we're talking about war today. We always thought that there'd be some sort of statement about war made and during the Vietnam War and the protests that people would learn, especially in my country, I'm talking about my country, we didn't learn. Um, it's safe to say nothing. As a matter of fact, we get worse. And uh, But uh, when I do projects now, I'm very often seeing what I do now and I'm seeing echoed earlier. So 
uh, in 2010, I received this sort of assignment to go down to the Arkansas Delta to look at conditions down there and what life was, and I went down there and made a set of photographs. And I came back, and I had looked at the photographs that I made, that I showed in the beginning of my career for years and years and years, and I went in there, and I found pictures I wouldn't have seen then that I didn't care about, and I made a book out of it called Rip All of a Sun, Slipping Down. And it's a, it, like your work, it's a text piece. Um, the text, I'll show you the piece, and you can understand that it doesn't match the, the photographs. What the text piece was is I met a, a woman in uh, mid-1980s who absolutely blew me away, and you'll see why. She was uh, trying to tear apart this house and put it back together, and she, she was caring for her granddaughters, sort of abandoning granddaughters, at the same time she was caring for her dying husband. And I did this interview with her. The bottom line, in case you can't can you understand what they're saying, is I thought she hated me. I thought she tolerated me because I was the white guy with a camera, and there's a certain politeness. Yet you have to be very careful when you travel to a photographer because you know people would be very polite to you because they think you come from somebody else, somebody else. And I thought that of her, and then I finally said to her, I'm going to leave, I have to leave. And she got so profoundly upset that I realized that what she was doing was holding her own feelings back, and as I was. So that's the text that you'll be hearing in some way. This is something I did with my son. Just far out in a cotton field, split by lightning, decaying, collapsing. Not so much a house as a memory of one. I made no effort to console poorly. And she blurted out that as a child, She was sometimes so hungry. She had scraped flour on the inside of barrels with a spoon. I wanted to hold her tight. And she told me Mr. Will had been bleeding in the mouth all night long. And her own heart was worrying her too. But I didn't. Ever since Portaline let me into her house, There had been this distance, a tension between us. She never looked me straight in the face when we talked. And if we weren't talking, She ignored me, except to shake her head when she thought I was taking too many pictures of her grandkids. Lots of times I went back to my hotel room, all headachy and depressed, feeling that I'm intruding. Then, tonight, I see a look of panic on her face, 
when I tell her it's time for me to leave the building. She presses her hand against her forehead as if to extinguish the pain there. and pushes past me out through the kitchen. Porter Lee calls her granddaughters up onto the broken and the kneeling stoop. Scylla sits in her lap. Sandra in mine. Let me watch the sun slip down. The red stain settling over everything. Shadows lengthen in the cast off box spring. Junk car and children's headless wheelless playthings melt together under the trees. The sun drops until it's at eye level and blinds us. I look down at my feet, then behind me. Having crawled from his bed into his wheelchair, Mr. Will is sitting there smiling. I nod, and he lowers his head into the clean, white handkerchief on his knees. What you'll do, poorly he says, is forget us. I wake bolt upright before dawn, hearing voices, someone coughing close by, and fumble for the light switch. It takes a full minute for the buzzing, fluttering, fluorescent tube to come on. And a few minutes more for me to be sure just where I am. Alone in the shoebox of a motel. My eyes drift from the cameras and clothes drop on the floor to a snapshot of Janine, to the window in the phone booth, out at the edge of the highway. When I put my glasses on, I see myself in the shaving mirror above the sink. I have my father's bushy eyebrows, a beard that's going gray, bald head, and a face that hasn't gotten fatter as the years have passed, but is less fleshy and slightly hollowed out. I peer outside when I hear a car start up, then back at the mirror. I can't help thinking about Portly and Mr. Will. About my first five time. About softly touching Janine. About life 
from death. And how little time there is. Yeah, this is a project that I did. I guess we would do with my family. It's never the understatement. We, um, like you did, we self published it. There was no publisher that would do a book like this. And we had to self publish for us personal, too. We found out that that's what was left to us. We, do, we did a Kickstarter campaign to raise money for this. Um, let's see, I'm going to bring it down. The, uh, I wanted to bring you up to date. This past year has been one. I think a lot of you who are in the world of magazines have seen the rapid decline of quote storytelling. I think, uh, well, not the decline so much as, as you'll see that we are burdened by certain stories that we keep repeating, and rightly so. There's incredible stories about the abuse of women. There's not enough of them. There's other stories that burn to death. Celebrity takes the front cover over and over again. Uh, so we would grapple with that, and then things happened to you. And one of the things that happened to us, when I say us, the family, is that I got a call from, uh, as if there wasn't enough mortality, Thomas was gone, friends were gone, I got a call from a cousin of mine who proceeded after a nice discussion, I hadn't talked to him in a year about thereabouts, and he proceeded at the end of it to say that he was fatally ill with cancer. And after we get over that, and what do you say to somebody? I made the mistake, in a sense, of saying, well, are there any disappointments? And he says, yes, I'm, I was always wrote poetry, and I could never get the book out that, that I wanted to. But I understand the need to do books and the difficulty of it. So collectively with the family, we, put, we published his book. We got an on-demand book. We you know, designed it and did essentially quite a lovely book, book of his poetry and uh, made it available for the family. It's the only people you can't find it necessarily on Amazon or whatever, maybe you can, but... Um, then, knowing the how you've you got to get material out these days, I said, well, maybe I'll go see them and, and do an interview with him. Uh, we got the book done. He actually had a book party. He was terribly ill, but he had a book party for his poetry book. Uh, and then we said, maybe we could put a little thing online and it'll tell people about the book so that people were not going to went there, but I, we got there too late. And by that time, Edward was, couldn't really speak, uh, to speak of. I had bought a video camera. We actually bought it the night before. We, we thought about being prepared. And it was still in the box. We, 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 signed, we took it out of the box. And then I shot this piece on Edward that day. And then I, as we were riding along the trees, Sam took the camera out the window and shot the trees. What we were trying to do is to give voice to his poetry. Um, it's not an easy thing because he's ill, but at least you'll get an idea of it very quickly. It's a short film, so I'll, I'll show you that now. The world we wake to brings them back. Just before daybreak, shadows that were lost to us in the dark emerge softly in growing light, like hands extending offering to lift the weight of shadows. What we walk into out of all day, what we can't touch that touches us before slowly fading as daylight separates us again. The story of our 
lives. It's more involved and complicated than science. The poems inveigle you to say what you like to believe and will betray you if you do believe them. The love keeps coming, punctual as death. You know, he thinks of himself as a father, as a husband, a brother, son. You know, and he's had many types of jobs of many types of people. I would say that poetry is a part of who he is, but not what he is. initially had a CAT scan done and that showed something and then they wanted an endoscopy two weeks later and then after that surgery, day surgery, we found out for sure that that, um, what it was and it was terminal. You never recognize me now. The whiskers have reappeared. The hair is shorter, straighter, and surely that sorrow in my eyes has lessened. Sometimes even I don't recognize me. Tonight, red-eyed, drowsy, and frowning, with frenzied hair, I see myself in the mirror, so hopeless, so serious that I cannot help myself. I smile. You know, I think we had similar backgrounds. But we were both very independent. I mean, one of us thought we would be married. It's just kind of funny how that worked out. We didn't have children for all seven years, so even before we had children, we had a sense of family. And they only gave him six months. I'm not sure how I would deal with that, but like, how are you so accepting of that? But it's very pragmatic. And he said, well, it is, you know, what it is. And I only have a certain amount of time, and these are the things I want to get accomplished. He's realized his long-time dream of publishing a book. So many who loved him, who gathered around his cradle and welcome, Stand among us. Joe, Sarah Jane, Pauline, Agnes, who all died before him, come forward now. One by one, they gather in this thin place, Nana said, where, what we're leaving behind, and what we're becoming touch.
Totally working until 11 o'clock. Both dogs are inside. Yeah, both dogs are inside. Yes. Okay. Love you. You can sleep, right? Not quite winter yet. Not quite the end of autumn. Near nightfall, she squints into windy light, shimmering high among trees in shadow. We think we live in such blinks of light, but sometimes, not a while, but later, in quieter light, we found we've grown into ourselves, as our mothers might say. And needless to say, that was I was reading Edwards poetry and the, uh, the text editor, Janine did the text editing and I worked with my son <coughs> Sam on the editing of the actual little film. Um, so the last thing, let's see uh, what we have here. These here, I'm going to very quickly show you because I don't want to keep you time. I periodically can't stay away from North Dakota. Why, why the hell I go there, I have no idea. We, we always joke, we'll never go back again. I think partially because the people there have I think it was a remark in there about people being too serious, and I'm inclined to be that way. And I think maybe the people I love most are serious. It's hard to describe it that way. And they're the people who are serious. You don't always like them, but they're overt about about their opinions and their feelings. And they tell you, as I go back, it's a difficult place. I think mean, you know, it's not a central place in anybody's life. It got in the news because it was an oil boom there that they talked about the relationship he went to Norway with the oil. I would go back and various times, and these are photographs that I would make. This actually had the uh, Sons of Norway uh, club that was burnt down. They made room for an oil, an oil club, and they took that old place down. It's in a town of Epping. Um, you'll see this man in the film. This is Melvin and his wife, and this is out on a piece of uh, North Dakota prairie. They call it Virgin Prairie. It's the prairie before it got turned over from the buff times of the buffalo. Um, Native American kid, before her land was torn up, the old companies were carrying up the land and building up these the housing for the workers. Um, one of the flames from the uh, the, uh, the rigs that have spread all over the countryside. Workers draining the oil pools. Um, one of the oil flares in the backyard of a bunch of old houses. People I go to really be fond of. I love this woman. She's homeless, and I love that see her in the morning and how well cared she was. She wanted to go out in the world looking good. So I brought her up there getting her makeup on. She had a whole carload of dogs, chihuahuas, nasty little things. <laughs> Another homeless family. She lives with her son, and also a whole uh, car full of dogs. A woman who just got evicted from her house by the oil companies came in and evicted everybody living in there and tossed them out. Place over. And this is a prayer service uh, done by a family. Uh, as you we talk about Norwegians, these are all Norwegian descendants um, in this valley that they were trying to keep the pipeline from going across their valley. So they, they had a very hot day. They had a prayer service. 
It turned out ironically to be the only demonstration in the state of North Dakota against the oil companies. It's just a little press I mean, I, I thought it was an act of violence when I photographed this. No, this guy had come up here, again, the American dream of making money in the oil fields, and he got, what I guess, a virus or a flu. Uh, he didn't have the money to take care of it, and he just fell over and, and, and died alone and, and, and at a gas station. See, um, bringing it up to, to date, and what I'll show you right now is a, is a short film um, uh, called The Rain Will Come. And uh, yeah, we have, we have time for you. Um, it was, a, I, I said I had met the couple before, I met them 10 years ago. I was very lonely when I met them. I'll tell you that, you get wandering around. And I had with a friend when we stopped during a snowstorm in this town of Corinth. And there was a little, little lady steps out. A lot of times they call the police on you, you know, and you see you all coming into their backyard. Um, and she just simply said to me a remark. She says, do you like history? It's like a, a non sequitur like, the fuck, you know, do you like history? <laughs> you know, I said, you know, I love history. And, and we came. She brought out all of her certifiable Norwegian cookies. That's what she said, big piles of them, and had tea. And we proceeded to talk. And... As I told my friend Terry and other friends that here, this is kind of an ageist story, but we, as we were sitting there having tea in very polite conversation, you could hear this guy yelling, you know, shit, all kinds of ex expletives from the back room. And he came out, and at that time, it was 10 years ago, it was Melvin, who you'll see, and Melvin was watching television, and our president, George Bush, was on television, and he was cursing the president in this huge voice, and he came out. It turned out they're very uh, progressive people, socially progressive, and uh, but came were, were descendants of the uh, Norwegians who first came out and settled this place. So uh, we never thought we came we came out here, and we uh, the remark was you, you know any Norwegians, and it's like you want to say you know oh sure I know Norwegians. I actually the fact that I do, but you don't know that they're Norwegian. I have some friends in Boston who are Norwegians, but we said. But we know them in North Dakota. And uh, so we went back and made this little film and it was to help with the foundation and help support it. And, a bit. and it's, um, it's, it's pretty, I think it pretty much speaks for themselves. But it's again about that, that conflict of, that's going on there in a lot of the world between uh, memory and the past. That turned out I didn't know, for example, at all that he fought in World War II. That, uh, he fought the Germans, and as you'll see in, 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 in a few scenes, but the conflict between his sense of home, which is disintegrating very fast, his town is literally a ghost town, as you'll see, and the future, and the future is, is out of his control now. Well, most of what I know about old Norway is what my uncle told me. My dad never told very much. He just wouldn't go back there. There was nothing to go back for. The expression he always used was they, they starved us out of there. People were actually starving. He used to tell about a woman that came to this country and then she, she married some rich guy and she come back to Norway a millionaire. And, that was the example they used that anybody can be a millionaire in the United States. In the beginning, they walked. or if they had a team of horses they horses were used. Everything was crude, everything was hand. When they first came out here, all this land was settled by about three, four cattlemen. They tell stories about having problems with some problems with the Indians, then they just buy them off with a steer or something and 
they'd go on their way. My mother and my dad came from the same place in Norway. My mother was came in 1903 and my dad in 1905. My mother was an orphan. She, she, she was not hard boiled, but she was a hard worker. My dad was a blacksmith. And, uh, fit in quite well in this homesteady days where everything had to be made by hand. In this country here they were looking for immigrants to populate the Great Plains where the weather was harsh and the The government told people that if you break the ground, the rain will fall. The rain forgot to come. My name is Melvin. I'll be 91 in 1st of April. I never thought that I'd ever get this old. I really don't know. Too damn stubborn to die, I suppose. Raven the Utamero Bathalong. Oh, cluck, 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 hern of a hogan. Cluck, 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 hern of a hogan. Hogan, hern is the hogan, hogan, and the hern is the hern of a hogan sprung. It's a kind of gore, it's a kind of griever, it's a kind of eager, it's a kind of gore. Pretty much alone in here. I've been here for all together about three years. I moved from one place to another and another. Do I miss the farm? Every day. Every day I think of something else. Ooh. It's constant howling. It would howl. My mother, the thing that nearly drove her out of North Dakota was the wind. Would blow for two, three days in a row. Dirt flying and packing rags around the windows to keep the dirt from coming through. You got so used to it that you, you, you ate dirt along with whatever else you had. So far we still felt the bell went through. 
My dad said he broke a quarter section of land with oxen for his uncle to pay his way over here. A whole year. He said when he left Norway he had $55 and a ship ticket to New York and none of it was mine. The thing was, everybody was in the same fix, the same shape. Nobody had anything. come through there on January 1st, 1916. The railroad had, had to have a stop. I was born at home. We were all born in that same old shack. Nothing was easy. There was no doctor. Only time there was a doctor that I was that my mother got pneumonia. I can remember the doctor say there is no hope. And she died the next day. She passed away during the war, just before the war started, she passed away, because my brother was just getting ready for the draft. He knew he was going to be drafted. She didn't want him to have to go to the war. There were three boys in our family, we were all drafted. I was 18 and I went. I hadn't been across the street yet. I was in the 106th Infantry Regiment, Battle of the Bulge. When the Germans come through at night, about four in the morning, and they were just shadows in the dark. It's awful tough to shoot another human being, better than what he is.
uh, it must have been early 40, early 45. We were being shipped from Europe to Japan, the whole island of Japan. And by that time, the bomb had been dropped. After the war ended, I came back here The only thing I knew was the war and then Corinth. But what keeps me there, I don't know. Thank you, everybody.